Uh, I've got a little something here that <clears throat> I've been studying for a while. And third, Monday night when Brother Rigsby was teaching, bam, it all came together. And I said, wow, I have a message. <laughs> Praise God. God gives us messages, and I just appreciate that. And I want to echo what Pastor said about passing the baton to the younger people. It's got to be the old pass, wherein it's a good way. You can't pass in that newfounded stuff. I'm, I agree with everything that was said here tonight. We got to pass on that which the Lord has given unto us. Amen. We need to pattern ourselves after Him, not after the modern day world. Amen. And I'd like to talk to you tonight about a subject right along those lines. If we turn in Matthew chapter 4. Amen. It seems like I just can't get out of Matthew 4. The last few times that we've... I've been up here, I've spoke out of this chapter. We're going to look at verse number, let's see, we'll start at about number 12. Amen. <clears throat> the Bible says, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zebulon and Nephilim. And it, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah, the prophet, saying, In the land of Zebulon, in the land of Nephilim, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light. Yes. And to them which sat in the region of the shadow of death, light is sprung up. <laughs> From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And skipping down to the very last verse, verse 25, notice, there followed him great multitudes of people. Amen. From Galilee, and from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. Amen. Let's pray tonight. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we can be here tonight. Amen. That we can feel what we're feeling. Lord, that we can hear what we are here to hear. That the worship and the music, that it was pleasing and acceptable unto you. Now let the word be confirmed tonight, Lord. Amen. As we bring forth that which is written, Lord, we want to be like you. We want to walk like you and do like you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And the church said amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let's clap unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. God is so good. Amen. Amen. We're talking here tonight about piercing the darkness. I wanted to call this uh, message tonight. I didn't know what to call it, but really I'm talking to you about piercing through the darkness tonight. Amen. But I, I entitled this multitudes of people, Gentiles mercies. Aren't you thankful for God's mercy? The very first song we sang tonight was about God's mercy. Amen. Everything through the service has been about the goodness of God. Amen. And how God is keeping us. Amen. But I wanted to talk to you tonight about this word or this area of, uh, in the Bible called Decapolis. We don't really talk a lot about Decapolis because, you know, we don't really think about the days and the times of Jesus. But see, many of the cities that would become to known as these ten cities that would be called Decapolis in the Greek. It was founded by the Greek soldiers of the, uh, <clears throat> the Tomalek and the Seleucid uh, kingdoms. Okay, These kingdoms were sections of the empire of Alexander the Great, and they were divided among his generals. So he dreamed of Hellenizing, or if you will, making Greek all the area of Decapolis. Yeah. Amen. The entire world, he, he wanted to... Uh, to, to, to Hellenize the, the area. Now, we're dealing with a lot of that here today. We're dealing with a lot of the same things that were happening when Jesus came. And how did Jesus pierce through all of these things? See, the dynasties that followed Alexander were devoted to Greek ideas, and um, <clears throat> they all integrated the local customs and practices of their particular cultures. So we're in a day now where we're looking at kind of the same pagan the cultures and the same practices that they did back in the days of Decapolis when light sprung up, amen, when light came to, the, to a dark world, amen. See, the Seleucids, they settled in Persia and in Syria, just to the north of Israel, and the, uh, the, the Ptolemies, that's how you say it, settled in the south in Egypt. These soldiers, these kingdoms founded many of the cities throughout Israel, Okay, and other uh, cities became Hellenized due to the influence of these two kingdoms. 
the Maccabean revolt and the, what, and the support of the revolt by the uh, Hadassim, the Hasidim, I should say, is those that are ferociously or fiercely devoted to Yahweh and to the Torah. So we're looking at an area where you have the Jewish people who are devoted to the Torah and all of these people bringing in a Hellenistic type of darkness. And so we're, we're seeing a battle. We're seeing a clash. All right. So the, all of these things were Greek thinking. They were the kingdoms that came to, de, de, to convert the Jews to these pagan values and to these practices. All right. So in about 64 to 63 B.C., the Roman general uh, Pompey, Pompey, he brought the entire northeast under Rome's dominion. He incorporated these Greek cities and the Sea of Galilee. He incorporated all these, these cities as a league known as Decapolis. Okay, before that time, during the Maccabean, Maccabean period, 167 to 63 B.C., a lot of these are my notes. I'll be reading a lot of notes tonight. Many of these cities had uh, resented the attempts of religious Jews to convert them to the religious practices. So there was a battle going on, as you could well see. When Rome assumed control of that area, the pagans were pleased to finally receive autonomy for their religious f fanatics. Okay, so they wanted to get away from anything that had to do with Judea. They wanted to get away from anything that had to do with the Torah. They wanted darkness. Amen. They wanted darkness. <clears throat> Through um, uh, though Caesar Augustus, it says, my, later gave two of these cities to Herod the king of the Jews for a little while. Throughout the New Testament, these ten, ten cities, they remained in a league of the free cities under the umbrella of Roman authority. So you can get the picture of the darkness. You can get the picture of the government, brother, that was in, in, in yes. control and what Jesus had to pierce through. Right. I'm talking to you about following him. Right. And not going to some newfounded thing, but looking to the way Jesus handled the situation. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. How did Jesus handle the situation? <clears throat> Although for much of its history, the Decapolis actually comprised of more than ten cities, it remained its designation as ten cities called the Decapolis. So many of the cities are familiar to the New Testament reader. We, we read of Damascus. We know where that's at. Philadelphia. Sothophilus. Uh, Gadara, Pella, uh, Gerasia, Hippos was a major decapolis city overlooking the Sea of Galilee from the east. Okay? These cities were joined by a league by the Romans to control the trade route that went from Arabia to Damascus and provide protection for the eastern frontier. So there was a lot of power right here. There's a lot of control of the, the economy. These people in this area minted their own coins. They had their own arts. They ruled over their own affairs. Uh, these cultures were prosperous in a Hellenistic doctrine in Roman glory. Amen. So darkness was prevailing. Now just stop and think about it for a minute. We just read about Jesus overcoming Satan in chapter 4. And he's appearing to Jesus to show him all these kingdoms of the earth. Alexander the Great had a mission. He wanted the whole world to be under the influence of Greek, Greece. He wanted their culture, their religion, their language, their philosophy, their political structure. He wanted all their values to be that which the whole world would embrace. He died before he could make this a reality, his dream. But his successors accomplished this goal to a large degree. <clears throat> Much of the known world, including many of the people in the land of Israel, adopted Greek ways although they modified them in their beliefs. Greek cultural institutions were established in many cities, including Jerusalem. Theaters became po uh, real common and popular. Rabbis forbade the attendance to these theaters because of the, the dramas. They portrayed, you know, modern-day stuff. You know, these things, they, they, they highlighted the, 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 the culture of the... Greek gods and the Roman gods and, and it was all about the theater and it was all about just think about Hollywood today it's all about what we want you to see it's what, what we want you to think it's what we want you to embrace and the rabbi said no the rabbi said no and there was a battle going on 
Now, we look at the rabbis and we think we like to say all those Pharisees and we, we like to talk about them and say what we will, but they had their battles. They did have their battles. Amen. When you're the man of God and you're on the platform, the pulpit, you have a battle. You're fighting the whole world. you got all these people coming under the influence of music. They're coming under the influence of culture. They're coming under the influence of movies and TV programs and all kinds of things from the theater. Amen. So attendance to these things were forbidden. Amen. Don't go to their festivals. Don't get yourself included with the sacrifices under their gods. Don't go to their gymnasiums. Don't get yourself into a Greek institution of education because you're just going to get indoctrinated. They're just going to make you believe their values are the right values. I'm talking to you about Decapolis, a Greek city, ten cities, and how this thing came about. The darkness. There's a lot of darkness here. Amen. Okay, so the Greek idea was training your bodies. It was to, to, to train your mind and to go to the higher forms of learning. And, you know, we take a look at America today and we're not too far away. You know, uh, <laughs> we think we got to have a, you know, a master's degree. We think we need to be a, have a doctorate or we need to have so many degrees or, or whatever before we can mean something or be somebody. And that's not what Jesus says. Amen. Students studied the philosophy of classical Greece. They received athletic training and they competed naked in athletic events. Much like today, brother, they're wearing scantily clad clothing. You see these guys, you go out to these wrestling matches and they got the real tight pair of shorts on and, and they're getting out there and it's all about the physique and it's all about the body and it's all about all these things. Greece. The Greek educational system was remarkably effective, see. It instilled Greek ideas into the entire generations of young Jewish people. It was reaching, if you will, the church. It was reaching the young Jewish with the bust of all these Greek gods and their heroes that they celebrated. It was the ultimate idea of humans. You know, we are, the, we are it, you know. And so it was all of these things that they celebrated. Amen. And so the, the young Jews read Homer. They wrote Euripides. I'm probably saying that wrong. Euripides. Plato, and they absorbed their values. They just was like a sponge. They started taking that stuff in. They also learned to draw the sculpt, and they often created the forms of the Greek gods. Because the Greek mythology, it offered them heroes and role models who competed against the Jewish biblical ancestors. The Pharisees devoted to keeping God's people faithful to the Torah, constantly admonished young Jews, intrigued with Greek culture. Do you see the battle? Do you see what's going on? Can you, can you relate? Can I get a amen? Can you say, hey, I see this where we are today. We're in the same pictures of darkness. Hellenistic cities had stadiums for public display of athletic contest. You can't, you go every Sunday when they have football. Guess what? They're worshiping in a stadium. They're right there just hollering and their, their voices are, are gone. They're clapping, they're hollering, shouting, they're drinking their beer. And these guys down there are doing just like we would do in the Greek setting. I remember reading years ago when I was a new babe in the Lord, Brother David Bernard wrote a book. Dr. David Bernard wrote a book about pursue holiness. And one of the things he wrote in that book was in regard to the Greek cultures and the, the way they worshiped in the stadiums, all of the athletes. And we got people today that it doesn't matter if it's Sunday. I can go down and I can watch my Green Bay Packers play football. Or I can go to the stadium and they just don't see the value or the importance of being gathered together with God's people. And it's a sad state of affairs, Pastor, brother, when we see people going through that situation in their life where they're actually looking at it like it's not a big deal. Temples were built to honor these local gods. Festivals were held to celebrate pagan holidays. We've adopted a lot of that stuff. In the midst of these attractions, the faithful Jewish population struggled to maintain its beliefs in Jehovah. The latest uh, architecture and artistic designs made the Hellenist, Hellenized cities of Damascus seem very attractive and modern. 
People from the small villages of Galilee, they must have just been in awe when they saw marble streets. They must have been taken away with the mosaic floors, the running water and all the fountains. They might have been just wowed like by these things, Pastor. You see, because this was something for them to see. People from the small villages saw these things. And Hellenism influenced much of the everyday life. In fact, the Greek language became the common tongue for the economic world. How many know our Bible is influenced by the Greek language? Alexander the Great may have died before he's seen some things happen, but this stuff had been pushed, and, it, and here comes light. Here comes light. <laughs> For the people... Few people did more to bring this Hellenistic ideas to the Jews more than Herod and his sons. Herod the Great. I don't know if you know this, but he took the steps of Jupiter. He went on the steps of Jupiter in front of the Romans because it was Caesar Augustus. Actually, he gave his dad a position which actually made Herod get a position but he was willing to do whatever he had to do to step on the next rung of the ladder. If I have to walk the steps of Jupiter, it doesn't matter. And I'll do what the Romans do. Yes. Old Dean Martin used to sing the song, When in Rome do as the Romans do. With you on an evening in Roma. And all, the whole world is just, the whole world is just taken, see. We're doing like the Romans and and so he did that. He went up the steps of Jupiter and made his confessions because in 40 B.C., Caesar, Caesar uh, Augustus said, you will be the, the king of Israel. And there was actually a king in Israel. And now we're looking at a man whose dad was an uh, Edomite. That's Hellenism, folks. Though Herod did uh, marry into the royal family, he tried to do things to make himself look like he was Jewish. But really, their religion was more of an Islamic religion. Even though there may not have been a Muhammad then, they were more of an Islamic tribal thing. So all of these things, if you can see, they've influenced the world today. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 Though they kept the Jewish rules, they, they wanted to pacify these religious subjects. Pastor, I'm just going to do this to pacify you. Here's what, this is what the king did. <clears throat> they didn't put their images on the coins in Judea. They didn't put, when Jesus asked whose inscription is on that penny, and it was Rome, that was Roman money. But for the Jews, their money, and notice when he said it on that coin, he said, should we pay tribute or not? Tribute is not tax. Tribute is where you're honoring a God. And on that coin was a, was a vision of their God, which would be the emperor. Yes. And that's why Jesus said, you give to Caesar what's Caesar. Yes. And unto God, that which is God's. Right. So in order to try to make the, the Pharisees and the, the rabbis happy, uh, King Herod tried to stay away from some of these things. Of course, he would avoid eating pork. He would avoid some of their art. He would do some things to try to say, I'm in the middle. Yeah. I'm in the middle. I can walk the steps of Jupiter, and I can do what i got to do to get Rome on my side. Right. But when you're over here, I, I'm just going to be right here in the neutral. Is that what you said, neutral? Sure. I'm in a neutral zone. Right. I don't have it in drive. I don't have my, stel I don't have my focus on a certain destination. I'm just idling. Isn't the church a whole lot like that? Mm. You know, the Herods, you know what they, they built theaters, stadiums, and gymnasiums. Man, you look at some of the digs that these, these, they built some fine things. Of course, they're all destroyed today. All the marble and everything's washed up on the seashore. Only the things that Christ has built has last. It failed to the faithful Jews to resist these cultural institutions and the values that they brought. It's where we are today. As a result, the Pharisees adopted increasingly detailed laws to remain faithful to the Torah. You know, we do that sometimes as ministers. Don't go that way. 
it may not necessarily be something that you'd find in the Bible, but a pastor would be reaching out saying, don't do that because you're going to get ensnared. You're going to get entrapped into that. So sometimes we tend to get a little bit too tight. Sometimes we tend to preach it just a little bit too hard. But we don't want you getting out into the world and getting into that Hellenized situation and th that Gnosticism and all the things that exist in the world today. So the, so the pastor has a hard role to play. His ministers and the body of Christ, we all have a hard role to play. And we got to look at this thing seriously as it is a war for life and death. Amen. The zealots, they resisted Hellenism more with violence. We're going to fight this thing. You see, sometimes we feel like we just want to fight these people. I'll break his neck. I'll take him out. You know, they keep doing these things and forcing these policies and bringing these things and you just want to fight. The Essenes, or the Essenes, they withdrew into isolated communities. So there were three different types of people that you had the Pharisees. Well, actually there was four because you had the Sads. They were sad. You know why they were sad? Because they were given into Rome because they were taking all of the delights of Rome. They just gave themselves completely over to Hellenism. There's churches today that have given themselves completely over to what the Roman governor, what does the government say? That's what we're going to do. We're totally, they're Sadducees. These were the things that were going on in that day. And these are the things that the capitalists personified. Amen. There were the supporters of the Herods, which we call the Herodians. They just gave into it. If it feels good, let's do it. You've heard that before. That's Hellenism. And the Herodians lived that way. That the capitalist city-states were satisfied to be free under Roman authority. Yes. How many people are satisfied today? Yes. They think they have freedom, but they don't have freedom. They could enjoy the Greek practices from sacrificing in their temples to eating pork, also used for sacrifices. Rome provided support for their cultural practices and helped them resist the seemingly outdated worldview of the Jews. The church is outdated, folks. And what was said, what Brother Rigsby said earlier, you, you have them saying to you, that's outdated. I don't care about that. And all the time you got the torch burning and you're wanting it to hand it to some young man or some young woman and you say, take this to the next generation. Take this and don't stop. Don't look back. This is the old way where it is a good path and you don't want to let go of that. Amen. Praise God. Amen. It is true. So they, uh, the, one of the most significant and magnificent cities of, uh, of Decapolis was Hippos, which is not mentioned in our Bible. It said on the hill, it could be seen clearly from the Sea of Galilee by the fishermen across the way in Capernaum. In other villages around the sea, ironically, this area would become, now check this out, <laughs> a vital center for the church. It was a central, a central focus of Christ's church. Because we see in the scripture where he goes and he pierces the darkness. Amen. We see what he does. Amen. Amen. And, and that city light was sprung up. And we're going to get into it in just a minute. I'm just laying a foundation. Amen. The Bible records the uh, two of Jesus' visits to Damascus. It also mentioned crowds of people from Damascus following Jesus. We read that. Understanding the pagan world represented by these city-states helps us see the significance of Jesus' response to it. His message clearly was for the inhabitants of Decapolis. For they followed him. Gentiles stooped in Hellenism and shrouded with darkness, brother. <laughs> Woo! Glory. Praise God. I'm getting excited. Amen. His message clearly is for the inhabitants of Decapolis, and he confronted the darkness of the pagan world in choosing to visit its people. We read those scriptures so effortlessly that we read when we opened up this message tonight. But what is it really saying? What does it really mean? 
Given the Jewish view of paganism of Damascus, it probably was not surprising to the disciples that as soon as he landed there, Jesus met a man possessed of devils. <laughs> Isn't that something? Turn to Mark chapter number four. Now I want you to know that when you're in the ministry, this is something that all of us have probably experienced. If we have it, then we're probably not doing it right. But when you're going on a mission to do something for the Lord, isn't it funny how the sea of turbulence, of tribulation and troubles and trials begin to open up everywhere you look? Isn't it funny? It's like something's trying to hinder my mission. Something is trying to intercept what I'm doing. And in chapter number 4, verse 35, it says, The same day when the evening was come, he saith unto them, Notice what Jesus said, Let us pass over unto the other side. That's the capitalists. That's the other side where you can see from the city, you can see across Capernaum, you can see the highlights of Paulus, and you can see all of the Greek theaters, you can see all of their magnanimous worldliness. You can see it. That's the other side. They don't go over there. And keep in mind that the sea to the disciples didn't represent life itself like it does. It does represent that alone, but it also represents troubles and storms and turbulent times. In fact, they refer to it as the abyss, where the demons say, don't cast us into the deep. Amen. So the water is not necessarily, it's a blessing, but then again, it represents chaos. It represents darkness is the same way. So when they had sent the multitude away, they took verse 36, him, even as he was in the ship, there were also with him other little ships. You see, that's how they did. They, they gathered together and they were in an area of chaos. So they, togetherness. Now no, notice what it says. And there arose a great storm of wind. When you're going to do something from God, you can count on there being a, a storm of wind. And the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say to him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? We're in the midst of chaos. Evil has befallen us. Master, we need you. People are sick all over. The, the sea of life and troubled times have come upon us. Help, Master, help us. Amen. And he arose, and he rebuked the wind, and he saith unto him, Knock it off. He's talking to the devil. Knock it off. You look into that a little deeper, that's exactly what he said. Stop. Knock it off. Yeah, come on. Peace. Be still. Yeah. Chaos. Stop. Right. Abyss. Hold fast. Hallelujah. Troubles and trials. Yeah. Stop. stop. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? A lot of times we don't even get out of our seats and make a move. You know why? Because we have fear. You sit around, well, I'm waiting for God to open the door for me. I'm waiting for the door to open. The door never opens. You got to kick the door in. You got to go in there. You got to start, go through the storm. You got to go through the troubles. You got to go through the trials. You got to move forward. Amen. You got to, you got your marching orders. We got our marching orders. We're living in a dark world. We got to take light to a dark world. Amen. We got to pierce the darkness. Multitudes of people with Gentile mercies. Amen. Need to pierce through the darkness. Amen. Amen. And he said, how is it that you have no faith? Notice that. They got fear and no faith. Because they don't have the right kind of love. And they have doubt in their hearts about the mission. This is an evil sea. Go over to the other side. Do you know what's over there? They offer sacrifices. They offer hogs over there. That's a picture of their fertility God over there. Where well, you want us to go over? Fearful. Is this getting anywhere? Praise God. <clears throat> and they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this? And even the wind and the sea obey him. Now I'm going to tell you right now, when you got a man and you're serving him, he's your boss, and the wind and the waves and everything obeys him, you don't need to worry. You don't need to be fearful. <laughs> you, you don't need to have a lack of faith. You need to trust him. Praise God, we need to trust him. Amen. 
He stilled the storm. Amen. His disciples were probably sitting there just fueled with this power, the sphere of the power of evil that resides on the sea and on the other side. Whew, can you imagine? Hallelujah. Amen. A lot of times we see some darkness and we don't want to confront it. We don't want to approach it. But Jesus got on the sea. The devil's probably saying to him, I gave you the chance to take all the kingdoms of the world if you just fell down and worshiped me. But let me get on your domain. Let me get into the world of your chaos and let me just speak peace. <laughs> let me just come into the darkness and just shine the light. Let me just do because I'm, I'm the Messiah. I am that I am. Amen. Amen. Foolishness for the devil to think. Amen. The devil was unable to prevent Jesus from crossing the sea to enter into pagan territory. So his demonic power confronted Jesus when he came ashore. Uh huh. And Jesus pierced the power of darkness that lay over that de demon-possessed man. Praise God. Hallelujah. Look at verse 5, chapter 5, verse 1. It said, They came over into the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come, now that's the capitalist, folks. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met out of him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Here comes Satan. I imagine the disciples, brother, I imagine they were like, Oh, we made a bad mistake. Lord, you don't. That's a bad mistake. This man, this man has got cuts all over his body. He's bare but naked. He looks like he ain't shaved in forever. His hair's probably like crazy. I mean, he's been in the tombs. Say graves. He's been in the graves. Can you say the word graves? I used to see a man out Shady Grove. I'd be in my house. There was a man that dressed up like a woman. Frank Hornin was his name. He'd get out there and he would walk around dressed like a woman in the tombs. I said, that man's possessed. I didn't even have the Holy Ghost back then. I knew that man was possessed. You don't have to have a college degree to know someone's possessed. You don't even need the Holy Ghost to discern that. <laughs> Do you, brother? It's obvious. So it was obvious to the disciple, this man's possessed. Look. Because he had oftentimes bound, he was be, he, they had bound him with fetters and chains. And, yeah. and the chains, he'd pluck them asunder. Yeah. He plucked them asunder. The fetters, he broke them in pieces. No man could tame him, the Bible said. All right. Always night and day, right. he was in the mountains yeah. and in the graves or the tombs, right. crying and cutting himself with stones. Yeah. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. I propose to you that that devil wanted to stop Jesus from his mission. I'm going to send you one of my most possessed possessions. But when that man saw Jesus, the demon knew what he was going to do. But that man inside, he cried out. He wanted deliverance. Amen. He, he cried out. Praise God. He saw Jesus afar off. He said, light, that's light. Light has sprung into darkness. And that man inside his spirit, being possessed with legion of devil, could say, there's light. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. He cried with a loud voice and said, now this is the devil that started to speak to him, through him. What do we have to do with thee, Jesus? Notice what he called him. Jesus, thou son of the most high God. Yeah. Ooh, that, I'll come back to that. Yeah. He's a son of the most high God. I adjure thee by God that thou tormentest me not. For he had said unto him, come out. Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. Yeah. Now we know that he gave a little rebuttal. Normally you don't make a banter with the devil. But Jesus decided to say, what is your name? He said, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him that he would not send him away out of the country. Now Luke 8.31 says, into the deep, the abyss. Amen. Don't cast us into the deep. See, demons hate water. <laughs> they don't want to be cast into the deep. Amen. 
says, don't cast us in the deep. He said, leave us, don't cast us out of the country. Now notice that there were nine of the mountains, a great herd of swines feeding. Now that represents the, their sacred animal for their fertility cult, their pagan practices. Now how appropriate would it be to just send those demons into their, so to speak, their little, uh, their sacred image? So, so it says, the devil's beside him saying, send us into the swine that we may enter them. Forthwith, I love the way Mark puts this, Jesus gave them leave. Like, he's the commander in chief. You can't get your leave without me. Go. <laughs> Go. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000. They were choked in the sea. And they... They that fed the swine fled and told it into the city and into the country of Decapolis. And as they went out to see what was done, they went out to see what was done. And they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the unclean or had the legion setting and clothed and in his right mind. Look, they were afraid. There's light. We're used to darkness. They were afraid. Our whole world. Our whole world is going to be turned upside down. Our whole culture. We just lost all of our sacred swine. <laughs> this is our sacred swine. This represents our fertility cult, our pagan way of worship. We don't have their blood to offer. We don't have their pork to eat. Oh, notice. Notice. So when they saw him clothed in his right mind, they were afraid. And they that saw told him how it befell him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. Just think about what the swine represented here. And they began to pray him to depart out of the coast. Point. Every time, not every time, should I say, that you witness to somebody, are they going to want you to stay around? Notice what Jesus did. He said, no, I'm going to stay here and I'm, you're going to see my light no matter what. When they told him to go, you know what he did? He got into the ship. And as he got into the ship, next verse, next verse, he that had been possessed with the devils prayed him that he might be with him. Let me go with you, Lord. Don't leave me in this area of darkness. Don't leave me around amongst the sacred swine. They got more swine on the other side of the hill. There's swine everywhere you look. There's all these things that represent. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay. So he's saying to them, let me go. I, I don't want to stay here. Amen. Now notice verse number 19. I, I want you to pay very close attention. Jesus suffered him not. You can't go with me. Right. You got a job to do. Right. He saith unto him, go. Go home yeah. to your friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for you and hath had mercy or compassion on you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory. Thank you, Jesus. You don't need a college degree. You don't have to go through the colleges of Decapolis. You don't have to be educated beyond your intelligence. You just got to give your testimony. You just go tell them what great things the Lord have done for you. See, sometimes we make this so incredibly difficult. But really, all we have to do is tell everybody our testimony. This is what God has done. This is how the Lord delivered me from darkness. And he departed and began to publish it in Decapolis, how great things Jesus done for him. And all men, what did they do? They did marvel. Look at that man. That man, there was, we couldn't chain him. We couldn't tame him. We couldn't put enough fetters of iron on him. That's a marvel. That's so this is his time. 
His time is now to go tell his friends. His time is to be a witness. Amen. So when Jesus settles the storm, when there's a storm and he settles it and you go on to your destination, I guarantee you there's a miracle coming. There's a change that's coming. Praise God. Jesus will pierce through that darkness. The demons will come out. Amen. And when they do, the one that's delivered, the one that is free, needs to go tell others what had happened. Amen. So the territory to which Jesus sent this man was certainly one of the most challenging mission fields to which ever anyone has been called. And this man, we have no sign of him being Jewish. We know that he was in a pagan country. Where the, where the uh, Pharisees say, stay out of there. There wasn't any uh, synagogues in Decapolis. Not until years after Jesus were synagogues built. It was a Greek city, Greek ten city Decapolis under Roman. But Jesus came to pierce the darkness. <laughs> Jesus came He put a man on the mission field Later crowds from Decapolis They followed Jesus Amen And they uh, heard this man's testimony And the effectiveness of his, his witness Look in Mark chapter 7 Look at Mark 7 chapter number 7 verse 31 Amen. I want you to see what's happening here. What's happening because of this man's witness. Amen. Because of his testimony. And again, departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, he came into the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the what? The coast of Decapolis. <laughs> Praise God. There's a third time it's in the Bible. Those are the only three times you'll find it. And they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment, 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 Sorry, in his speech, and they beseech him to put his hand upon him. He took him aside from the multitude. He put his finger in his ears, and he spit and touched his tongue. Looking up to heaven, he sighed, <clears throat> and he saith unto him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And straightway the ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak plain. <laughs> And he charged them that they should tell no man. But the more he charged them, so much the more a great deal they published it. And were beyond measure astonished, saying, He hath done all things well. He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. Amen. Praise God. Yeah. Amen. And in the book of Matthew, chapter, chapter number uh, 15, turn with me there. I'm, I'm giving you the results here of what happened. Verse number 29 we know that it says in verse 29, Jesus departed from thence and came nigh unto the Sea of Galilee and went up into a mountain and sat down there. Now, this is not telling you that he was in Decapolis, but this is the, this is the parallel to Mark. So we know he went into Decapolis, Decapolis. And great multitudes came unto him. There's our great multitudes again. They followed him. That's what the Bible says. Having with them those that were lame, that were blind, that were dumb, that were maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet. And he healed them. Insomuch, notice this, the multitude wondered. And when they saw the dumb to speak, that the maimed to, to be whole, and the lame to walk, and the blind to see, they glorified the God of Israel. <laughs> I love that. They glorified the God of Israel. All the struggle and all the fight with the darkness, it's only going to be settled by the glory of the God of Israel. Amen. Because he is the miracle. He is the miracle worker. It is possible that the distant country Jesus referred to in his parable of the prodigal son was pro probably Damascus. It fits that description. Maybe a Jew wandered into Damascus. Maybe he left his inheritance of his father. Maybe he wandered into the world. Maybe he decided, I'll go try the things in Hellenistic, the, the Hellenistic world of the Greeks. I'll, I'll find my fame, my fortune. I'll find everything that I'm looking for. I'll go in there and I'll do all. I'll spend my living. And the next thing you know, you find yourself in the, in the pen with the swine. And you're looking at the husk of the corn in the trough. And you're saying, you're starting to salivate. You're saying, that looks good. All the depths that sin will bring us to. Certainly it was distant in its values and its beliefs. Was the capitalist not? It was definitely a place for wild living. 
It had plenty of pigs that needed to be fed. Maybe it'd be a short walk back. It'd be a short walk back to the Father, you know. No one knows it was in his mind in this parable, but to me, it just makes perfect sense. People are going out into the world, Pastor. Many visitors to Galilee are amazed at how Jesus' area of ministry was gone over to Decapolis. It's pagan. Sure. Jesus did not avoid those people living in darkness. We read that in our opening scripture. He went to them and pierced that darkness of their sinful lifestyle with the light of God's message and salvation of his love. Praise God. Jesus wants us to follow his example in confronting the darkness in our own world. And that's the key point I'm trying to make here tonight, that we have to follow his example. The power of Satan and his demons seem overwhelming. It would be easy for us to isolate ourselves in some safe place of solitude. Maybe we can find our refuge somewhere away from the way the world is going. Or, or we can find a rule-bound community that, that we could just get ourselves involved in where where we feel safe or, or, you know, so that the outside world just can't get around us. But even through rules and community, all this is necessary, necessary for our Christian living. Jesus used neither of these as his escape. He modeled another way for us to follow. He left the familiarity, the familiarity of his own community and confronted evil on its own turf. Amen. At its core, folks, Hellenism is just humanism. That's all it is. Humanism, that's what we're dealing with today. Our kids are being indoctrinated. We need to pull them out of schools and teach them at home. Our, our answer, the answer to our problems today is not necessarily going forward with more progressivism. It's going backwards. The pastor said it right. Remember the old landmarks. Remember the old way where it is a good path. We need to go back. We need to model the Lord, Alex. We need to model him. Amen. We don't need to glorify human beings above all other creatures and portray our human body as the ultimate physical beauty. Truth can be known only through the human mind when it comes to humanism. And pleasures is the ultimate goal of humanism and Hellenism. Hellenism's values permeated the gymnasium and its excellent source of education. The theater, the games, and the arena, the majestic, the majestic Romanized forms of Hellenism, Hellenistic art, uh, art, architecture must have seemed harmless enough, but its temples glorified the excess of pleasure. What does the world look at today, Sister Rose? The world today is all about pressure. It's all about our pleasure. Yeah. It's all about your comfort. We don't know what it's like to be in the desert. We don't know what it's like to feel extreme heat in the desert with the scorpions and with all of the things that are around about us, all the dangers that we might encounter. We got it padded. We got padded pews. We got AC. We got everything luxurious. The religious Jews of Galilee struggled against the pagan worldview. Seeing the exceptionally modern perspective of Hellenism can help us understand their struggle. We go, we're going through the same thing. It can also help us understand, not excuse, the legalistic excess of some of the Pharisees. We can understand that. I can understand why a pastor would be so adamant about you staying away from some, certain things. Because he cares for your soul. I would rather have a man of God measure it off and say, don't pass this here. And it be just a little bit more excessive than what needs to be. Because when I make it to heaven, will it really matter? No. Amen. Amen. They glorified sexuality, violence, wealth, the human form. The view that only what a human mind can understand and formulate can possibly be true. And that's where we are today. If it's not that the human mind can't comprehend it, it just... It's not understandable. Right. That's the value system of humanism. Right. The followers of Jesus, today we wrestle with this worldwide view. Yes. Uh -huh. 
In the process of struggling against it, the seductive power, some Christians become pharisaic. Some people want to escape to a small, safe community like the Essenes. And some even resort to violence, like the Zealots. But Jesus wanted us to follow his example. He sailed across the sea and he confronted evil directly to bring his message and his love to a fallen Hellenistic Decapolis. That's beautiful. Beautiful. Amen. Amen. All right. It's clear. It's very clear that we're in a struggle today. It's very clear that that we need to avoid all the uncleanness and all the things of the world, all of the things that the, that the pagans do. We, we need to avoid these things. You know, the problem that happens, though, is that just like with the Pharisees, that we tend to hate the sinner along with the sin and the dilemma that they're enshrouded in. You see, sometimes we start calling them names and we start coming after them. Sometimes we just... We just in our frustration, in, in, in the way we feel. Sometimes we just get a, a, just a burr in a saddle over it. And we just want to fight. We just get angry. And we don't, we don't need to let it bring us to anger. And I'm going to finish with these thoughts right here. If i got enough time, I'm going to try to hurry. Lord, have mercy. I want to tell you, Jesus is not only the bread of life to the Jewish nation, but he's the bread of life to the Gentiles. Amen. Look in Mark chapter 6. I'm going to hasten to hurry. Well, before we go there, I'm going to want you to look at Joshua chapter 3 and verse 10. Joshua chapter 3 and verse 10. I'll find it in a minute. <clears throat> Notice what the Bible says. Joshua said unto the children of Israel, here's the words of the Lord. He said, Hereby you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out before you, notice this, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Seven nations. These seven nations were known to have been driven into the area that we know today as back in Jesus' day as the Decapolis. Now look in Acts chapter 13. I'm sharing some things with you here. Verse number 19. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. Now these seven nations are well known to be pagan. Because of their practices, God says, I'm going to drive them out of the promised land. Amen. Now, let's turn to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, starting with verse number 30. If you're trying to pull that up. Uh, amen. <clears throat> Jesus immediately knowing in himself that, wait a minute. That's not it. I'm in the wrong spot. Here it is. That was chapter 5, 6 and 30. And the apostle gathered themselves together unto Jesus, told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into the desert place and rest a while. Right? And there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a private place by ship privately. When he saw them departing, and many knew and ran afoot thither out of the cities, and out went them and came together in them. Jesus, when he came, saw much people. He was moved with compassion towards them because they were as sheep having a shepherd, have, not having a shepherd, and began to teach them in many things, right? So he set them down. Let's skip on down. He set them down. And he said, how many loaves have you in verse 38? Five and two fishes. He commanded them to sit down on the grass, verse 39. Forty, he set them down by rakes, hundreds and fifties. 41, and when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked into heaven, he broke the loaves, and he gave to the disciples, and they ate. Notice this. They ate and they were full, and they took up 12 baskets full. See, Jehovah Jireh, God will provide for the tribes of Israel. We know that the 12 is the 12 tribes of Israel. 
because he's dealing with the Israeli people. Now let's look in chapter 7 of Mark. Now we know where he is in chapter, or chapter 8. I'm sorry, chapter 8, verse 1. We know where he is here because we just read in 7 he was in Decapolis. And he was ministering. Many, many of these seven nations were following him. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and saith unto them, I have compassion on the multitude, just like he did the Jews. Because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their houses, they will faint by the way. You talk about care. You talk about compassion. For divers of them came from far. And his disciples answered, where are we going to get enough to feed these people? So reading on down, we know that he blessed, he break, and he fed all of these people. And when the thing was over, we know in verse number 9, they that were eating were about 4,000. He sent them away. That Verse 8 says that they had seven baskets full. That's the Gentile nations. He's in Decapolis, folks. He's telling the Gentile nations, I love you. I care for you. You're in darkness, and you're going to see great light. I am the light. Amen. Folks, Jesus has shown us the way. We've got to confront it on its own turf. We've got to take the word. It's one thing to have it in here. It's altogether different when we take it to Decapolis. You stand up. Praise God. I've given you all that I can give you. Amen. It's 9.04. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to hand the mic over to the pastor. God bless you. I hope you got fed with this. Amen. Because this was wonderful. Amen. This is wonderful. Seven baskets, folks. He's our bread of life. Yes, he is. Amen. Just like he is the Jews. Yes. 